Hello. One of the privileges of being a geologist is going out to the field and seeing the rocks that describe the history and the processes that we see today. Join us as we go to North Carolina to see the rocks that describe the Blue Ridge Escarpment. Come on. In the eastern United States, there's a continuous ledge across the eastern boundary of the Appalachian Mountains. It is about 250 miles long, extending across four states, and has an elevation difference across it of about 300 to 600 meters, or about 1,000 to 2,000 feet from the top to the bottom. This feature is known as the Blue Ridge Escarpment. The Blue Ridge Escarpment is home to a good chunk of the Blue Ridge Parkway shown here as the Blue Line, which connects the Smoky Mountains National Park to the Shenandoah National Park. Millions of people every year come from all over to drive and hike along the edge because it provides incredible vistas unlike anywhere else in the eastern United States. What is this thing? Why does it exist? And what's it made out of? Today we're going to take a tour of the geologic history and processes that make up and control this feature. First, an escarpment is defined as a sharp, continuous slope that separates two plateaus of elevation. The Appalachian Mountains are broken into four physiographic provinces called the Appalachian Plateau, Valley and Ridge, Blue Ridge, and the Piedmont. In this case, the Blue Ridge Escarpment separates the lower, flat Piedmont province from the rough and higher Blue Ridge province of the Appalachian Mountains. The geologic history of the Blue Ridge Escarpment rocks and the Appalachian Mountains are a complex and confusing puzzle that people are still working to figure out today. In this video, we will cover some of the basics and tour some very cool spots along the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina that include Grandfather Mountain, Linville Falls, Chimney Rock, and Stone Mountain. After watching this, you can visit these places and give unprompted geologic lectures to your friends, family, and unsuspecting visitors who will no doubt apply your knowledge. To add some authority, feel free to wear a rock hammer, clunky hiking boots, a vest, a baseball cap, and a notebook with illegible writing and sketches. The first major structure we will tour is the Grandfather Mountain window seen here. It is 45 miles by 25 miles across and includes landmarks such as Grandfather Mountain and Linville Falls. Just like a window in your house, a window in geologic terms is a hole and a structure revealing the material behind it. In this case, the structure is the Blue Ridge Thrust Sheet, which is a group of rocks that moved over top of other rocks due to compression of the crust from continent-continent collision. This occurred during the final assembly of Pangaea when Africa collided with North America between 310 to 280 million years ago. Over time, the thrust sheet was locally eroded down creating a hole, or a window, in the material that moved over top again revealing the rocks beneath and creating the Grandfather Mountain window. The rocks outside of the window in the Blue Ridge Thrust Sheet are of a wide variety of rock types and ages spanning from 1.2 to about 400 million years old. Inside the Grandfather Mountain window are three main groups of rocks. First are about 1.1 billion year old gneisses. These make up the true basement floor of the Blue Ridge. The second are overlying metamorphosed 600 to 700 million year old volcanic igneous and sedimentary rocks. And then third are about 540 million year old sedimentary rocks of the Jill Howie group. First, we'll take a look at the basement floor and oldest of the group at the Raven Rock Outlook just outside the town of Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Besides a decent view, right on the other side of the parking fence, the Blowing Rock Nice makes up the ledge. It is considered a very coarse and foliated Augen Nice with a quartz monzonite composition. In German, Augen means eyes, which is fitting as it has large eye sized feldspar crystals that distinguish it from other gneisses in the Grandfather Mountain window. In this case, the hills literally do have eyes. Micas are also visible surrounding the eye-shaped feldspars, creating a slight layering look. These rocks are about 1.1 billion years old and are the true basement rocks of the Appalachians. They were likely in place as igneous underground magma that cooled to granite, and then some of that became a different type of rock called a metamorphic granite gneiss prior to and during a giant mountain building event due to continent-continent collision about 1.3 to 1.1 billion years ago. This event is called the Grenville Orogeny, and it assembled a supercontinent called Rodinia, which you can see in the top right. This supercontinent, where you have one giant continent and one giant ocean, preceded the more well-known supercontinent of Pangaea by hundreds of millions of years. The word orogeny is Greek for mountain creation, and the word rodinia originates from either the Russian word for birthplace, as in birthplace of the continents, 
or the Greek word for pomegranates, which seems less likely, but does almost have the word granite in it. Overall, the Blowing Rock gneiss is pretty nice, and other gneisses are nice too, such as the Wilson Creek gneiss, which can be spotted along the parkway as well. Nice. While you're at the Raven Rock Outlook, keep an ear out for the steam engine train whistle from the family fun Wild West themed Tweetsie Railroad Amusement Park just down the valley near Boone. Be sure to stop at the Thunder Hill Overlook just down the road as well. So we have covered the basement rocks, but what about the rocks that make up Grandfather Mountain, known as the Grandfather Mountain Formation? This brings us to stop two at the Boulderfield pull-off on the Blue Ridge Parkway. The Grandfather Mountain Formation is made up of metamorpho sedimentary and volcanic igneous rocks that are sitting right on top of the older basement rock gneisses. 600 to 700 million years ago, the supercontinent of Rodinia was trying to rift and split apart. Because of the rifting, basins were created which allowed for deposition of silt, sands, and other sediments to a thickness of about 7 kilometers. The stretching and fracturing of the crust also allowed for mantle, upwelling, and magma to intrude into those fractures and then solidify. This is analogous to the present-day East African Rift System. During later mountain building events, the Grandfather Mountain formation folded and metamorphosed as the overriding thrust sheets slid over it. Here at stop 2 is a good spot to see the igneous rock related to the volcanism during the time. This rock is called the Linville Metadiabase, and good examples of it show the dark black or gray color with large dark green amphibole crystals. There are also good examples of snails on sticks, as seen here. To see the resistant metasediments of Grandfather Mountain, you can drive a good distance up the ridge through Grandfather Mountain State Park to our third stop. At the top, you can see the famous swinging bridge which was originally built in 1952 and is exactly one mile high in elevation. The foundations of the swinging bridge are bolted into a pebble conglomerate, likely originally deposited into a basin as an alluvial fan. Other attractions at the top include incredible views, except for this specific hotel, good hiking, and displayed wildlife habitats where you can see some of the friendly tenants of Grandfather Mountain. Something that I cannot go without mentioning is that a man who worked at Grandfather Mountain came up to our field trip group after seeing a Virginia Tech sweatshirt and told us a story. Apparently, back in the day, people would hang glide off Grandfather Mountain. It was first done in 1974 by a Mr. John Harris. Through the 1980s, they would hold hang gliding competitions at the top of the mountain. One day, in 1984, a hang gliding legend named Stuart Smith allegedly took off Grandfather Mountain and floated 112 miles to the Virginia Tech campus. This is absolutely insane, and you can see our reactions to being told this story. Right. Somebody took off from up here. Where they came back down to the ground is the campus of your school. No, no. 112 miles. Whoa. Oh, I don't know, I think it was a day long, the city northwest winds. Wow. I could not find any official record or photo showing this feat, but it has been posted by the Grandfather Mountain Facebook account and was quoted by Jesse Pope, who as of 2020 was the head of the Grandfather Mountain Steward Foundation. Here's a clip of the legend Stuart Smith jumping off and flying around Grandfather Mountain. Anyway, back to the Grandfather Mountain window. The last place within the window we will visit is Linville Falls, which is located within the Chilhawi group on the southwest margin of the window. The entire exposed Chilhawi is actually a piece of the tabletop thrust sheet, which is overriding the older gneisses in Grandfather Formation, 
but is still part of the grandfather window because it was beneath the Blue Ridge Mega Thrush Sheet. The Chilhowie is at least 1,200 meters thick here and is made up of quartzite, meaning it primarily consists of the resistant mineral quartz. These sandstone quartzites were originally deposited in a river and shallow marine environment back about 540 million years ago during the Cambrian period, during the active opening of the Iapetus Ocean. In Greek mythology, Iapetus is the titan father of Atlas, which is the namesake of the Atlantic Ocean. So the Iapetus is the ocean that existed before the Atlantic Ocean. Because of the opening of the Iapetus as a new ocean basin, a lot of ocean sediments were deposited. We know this partly because there are preserved fossils of burrows called Scolithos that sea worms originally dug and lived in along energetic coastal beach environments. If you walk to the Linville waterfall, the river is running through the quartzite and is really well exposed. If you look closely, you may notice that the rocks are a bit wavy looking or even folded. These are what are called large sheet folds that occurred much later during the Allegheny Orogeny when the Iapetus closed and the Blue Ridge and Tabletop Thrust Sheets and Shear Zones were actively moving due to the continental collision of Africa into what is now North America during the assembly of Pangaea. The sandstone got really messed up during this orogeny and was metamorphosed, deformed, smeared, and folded over multiple times. Here you can see the cross-section of what this area would have looked like at the time. That wraps it up for the Grandfather Mountain window. Now we will actually move into the Piedmont province across the defining Brevard Fault Zone just southeast of Asheville, North Carolina to stop five at Chimney Rock. This is a bit further off the Blue Ridge Parkway, but you can drive directly to Chimney Rock within the state park. At the parking lot and visitor center, there's a spectacular view of Lake Lure and the canyon carved by the Broad River. The park is super accessible, so you can continue to the top by either walking up the stairs or taking the elevator, which is carved into the rock. Chimney Rock stands tall above the landscape because of the resistant rock here called the Henderson Nice which like the blowing rock gneiss is an augen gneiss, which again is German for eyes and has eye sized feldspar and quartz crystals. The gneiss is strongly foliated, meaning it's been stretched and compressed with the dark color mineral biotite surrounding the large crystals. The Henderson gneiss went through two periods of metamorphism, the first around 535 million years ago in the Cambrian during the opening of the Iapetus Ocean, and then again when the Iapetus closed during the Allegheny Orogeny. During this time, the Appalachian Mountains were at least as large as the modern-day Himalayas, and crustal flow and shearing forces strongly influenced the Henderson Nice, as it was very close to major structures such as the Brevard Fault. As a result, you can see intense sheet folding of the Nice throughout its exposure. It's particularly visible on the hiking trail at the Subway Tunnel. The Henderson Nice also props up the cliff, resulting in Hickory Nut Falls, which is just a short hike from the parking lot, and I highly recommend going and seeing it. Nice. Alright, the last stop is the aptly named Stone Mountain which is nestled into this corner of the Blue Ridge Escarpment just south of the town of Sparta, North Carolina, and is visible from the Stone Mountain Overlook off the Blue Ridge Parkway. As you can see, Stone Mountain has this unique dome shape. It is made of a rock called granodiorite that is similar to granite, but has more feldspar minerals than quartz. It dates to about 336 million years ago as a magmatic intrusion into the older metamorphic rocks of the Blue Ridge that occurred due to over-thickening of the crust during the Allegheny Orogeny. It is one of the best examples of a granite monodoc, 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 monodoc in North Carolina, which is an isolated hill that is resistant to erosion. 
Stone Mountain owes its unique shape to a process called exfoliation weathering, also known as onion weathering, where it erodes in curved slabs. This is due to its deep earth origins and homogeneous granitic makeup. When the magma first intrudes and cools as a pluton, it is under an immense amount of pressure from the overlying earth. Over time, as erosion works to uncover the cooled magma body over many millions of years, the pressure becomes less, but because there are no cracks or flaws in the material, the pressure is always released at right angles to its outer surface. Once fully uncovered, that unconfined pressure results in a fracturing and peeling of the rock surface into slabs. Once slab cracks are formed, water can run through it to accelerate the peeling process, and so can vegetation such as tree roots that can wedge their way in and start to peel it away as well. The trees that are growing on the top are pretty amazing though because there's absolutely no soil, so I'm not really sure how they're doing that. Exfoliation weathering is a well-documented process that happens on similar granitic bodies elsewhere, such as Sugarloaf Mountain in Rio de Janeiro or Half Dome at Yosemite in California. Stone Mountain sticks out like a thumb or perhaps a knuckle from the surrounding terrain because it is more resistant to erosion than the older, foliated and fractured up gneisses that surround it. Geomorphology is the study of the shape of the landscape as it relates to the geologic processes that control that shape. We just touched on the geomorphology of Stone Mountain, but what about the Blue Ridge Escarpment as a whole? The Blue Ridge Escarpment is the geomorphic feature that I initially introduced and it is a sharp, continuous slope that acts as the eastern boundary of the Appalachian Mountains, separating the Blue Ridge Province from the lower and flatter Piedmont Province. Escarpments have been recognized around the world. Some prominent examples include the Great Escarpment of Australia, the Great Escarpment of South Africa, and the Great Escarpment of Brazil. At this point, you're probably realizing that geologists aren't very creative at naming things. Escarpments in areas that are far from tectonic plate boundaries, such as the locations I mentioned, are generally thought to originate tens to hundreds of millions of years ago, when the continents were split apart by seafloor spreading. In the case of the Blue Ridge Escarpment, it derives its origins from the opening of the Atlantic Ocean during the breakup of Pangaea, where you have an original fall rifted edge that migrates further and further away from the sea due to that seafloor spreading and continual erosion backwards over time. Escarpments are also typically markers for the continental drainage divides. The red line along the east edge of the Appalachians is the Eastern Continental Divide. East of it, rivers are steep and flow a relatively short distance to sea level into the Atlantic Ocean. West of it, they flow a much longer distance all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Here is that distance laid out in a graph showing the elevation profile of the rivers on either side of the East Continental Divide. On the east side, it shows the relatively short and steep path of the Roanoke River draining into the Atlantic Ocean. On the west side, the path is overall less steep and really flattens out once joining the Ohio River and eventually the Mississippi over a distance that is five times longer than the east side to get to sea level. This means that the east side has much more potential kinetic energy and force to erode, which is why over millions of years the escarpment has eroded and migrated westward. A technique called thermocron age dating indicates that the escarpment has eroded back at a rate of about 1.3 kilometers per million years, or 130 kilometers or about 80 miles over 100 million years. In some places within the Piedmont, as much as one kilometer of rock overhead has been removed since that time. There's a lot more to say on how this erosion specifically occurs, but that covers the basics. To wrap things up, we've seen the origin of the rocks from the 1.1 billion year old Granville Basement up through the 300 million year old intrusions associated with the final collision of North America and Africa. We also saw why the landscape is rugged and how different processes and the rocks themselves help shape the region and give it so much of its natural beauty. With that, we'll end the video here. I'll let Amanda take the outro. We're finally back in Blacksburg and we saw all of the Blue Ridge Escarpment rocks that we could see in North Carolina. Thank you and if you choose to go out and see the geology yourself, get out there and be safe. <laughs>